Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Gary Morrill is joining us, and he's got some really interesting stories from the 1970s to tell us, and then we bring it right up to speed to today with how to recruit new engineers, how to teach them, where do we learn? It's all coming up on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, savings, and support, online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the Calrec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP-based radio system from Calrec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and everything in between, too. I'm Kirk Harnack, delighted to be here with you today on this Thursday, May the 9th. It's our 443rd episode. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee at the uh, Telos Alliance studio. Telos Alliance graciously gives me a couple hours off on Thursdays to uh, do the podcast, and I'm delighted about that. So happy to, oh, I'm wearing my Telos shirt today. Here, I get you, you you may think I have a bunch of these. No, I just wash them a lot. <laughs> I like black shirts. <laughs> they make the skin look good. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, Chris Tobin uh, is not going to be with us today. He's got a personal thing that he's handling uh, today in New York City, and he couldn't be with us. But he will be with us next week. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick preface for next week. Next week, uh, I'm going to be speaking at a small uh, conference of broadcasters called the International Broadcasters Idea Bank or the, uh, the Idea Bank or the IBIB. Uh, and the Idea Bank is composed of, it's limited to 100 members. And they are members from mostly the U.S., but there are a few international broadcasters as well. And they are they meet twice a year uh, in different locations around the world, mostly that, well, they meet where members are because members host the conferences. And next week, of all places, the, their conference is in Cleveland, Mississippi. And you may be thinking, Cleveland, Mississippi, what a place to have a conference. Well, they have a beautiful university there, Delta State University, and they have fantastic meeting facilities. And they also have the uh, Grammy or one of the Grammy museums is in Cleveland, Mississippi. And it is a gorgeous, absolutely stunningly beautiful facility. It's it's only, uh, gee, I guess it's only uh, three, four years old or so at the most. And uh, so that, that's where they're meeting. I'm speaking there, uh, giving some ideas about uh, technology uh, moving into the future. Also, I'm on a panel of uh, engineers with uh, uh, Gary Klein and a few other engineers. It's going to be a, a really good event. So I'm sorry I can't invite you to go there because it's, it's a closed event, open only to uh, Idea Bank members. But uh, anyway, that's where I will be um, next week. And that means that Twert will be coming to you next week, probably from a transmitter site. We're going to try to arrange to, to do the show from um, a transmitter site in Heads, Mississippi. It's a wide spot in the road with a big old tower and four FM stations, uh, including a big um, uh, K-Love e you know, EMF station there and three of our uh, my FM stations there as well. So anyway, hopefully that'll happen next week. Chris uh, Tobin will be back with us next week to uh, talk about that. And we'll have a guest. Next week, our guest will be Mike Erickson of uh, Wheatstone. We'll be talking about audio processing. So that's going to be pretty cool. Going to get, get the gang all together. All right. <laughs> this week, let's talk about this week here. Coming up on this show, our guest is uh, a fellow that I met a few years ago and have become friends with. He's just an amazing engineer, super nice guy. Uh, good to have as your friend or your mentor. Let me introduce to you, Gary Morrill. Gary, hi. Welcome to this week's hey, radio. How's it going? It's how's going it well. Going? Where are you Excellent. coming to us from? Uh, I am in my office. I'm based in Saginaw, Michigan. Aha. Uh -huh. What well, what's the Saginaw, Michigan song that became that made the town famous? A country song, maybe? Oh, yeah. There's a, there's an old song. I lost my heart in Saginaw, I lost Michigan. My, was it? I left. I said I left my heart in San Francisco, left but I lost heart, my heart. Left my heart. Yeah. In Saginaw, Michigan. Yeah, <laughs> oh my baby. goodness. Uh, and hey, I was looking. I was looking at your um, your uh, signature on your email uh, that we've been tossing back and forth, and I looked at the name of the street that your broadcasting company that you work at, uh, the street that that it's located on. And yeah. I, I don't think I could pronounce it. Can you pronounce the name of that street? I, I sure can. You see, in Michigan, you have to be able to pronounce all of these Native American names, <laughs> and that is Tittabawasi. What? Is that, can you say that on the radio? Yeah, well, I can. I can. 
<laughs> you, know, you know, when when uh, when we started the show nine years ago, uh, Chris Tarr was one of our co-hosts. He still makes a, a cameo appearance now and then. And he, I had the biggest problem trying to say McWanago, uh, Wisconsin. McWanago. And about the time that he decided not to be a regular on the show, but to make cameo, that's about the time that I got to be <laughs> to pronouncing it correctly. Well, but we your street have is so many. Yeah. We have, there are so many names in Michigan Kirk, that 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 are so challenging to pronounce. But then I think every part of the country is that way. <laughs> Titabawasi. We have, you know, uh, here in Nashville, and and hey, folks who are listening, we're we're having a good time on this show. But we are going to cover some serious topics. But uh, uh, Gary's the kind of guy that you just want to have have a good time chatting with. You know, I was just thinking about uh, your 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 road there where the radio stations are on. Uh, Titabawasi, if I've got that right, mm-hmm. we we have a street here in Nashville that is pretty tough to get right. It's it's spelled as if you would pronounce it Demon Breun, and that doesn't roll off the tongue very well, Demon Breun. Uh, but that's how it's spelled. Right. Uh, it's pronounced Demon Breun. Wow. Demon Breun. Yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah, people, hey, turkey left there, at Demon Breun, Breun, Breun. Breun. <laughs> It's just, it's well, it gets it gets kind of interesting up in this part of the country because Saginaw is one of three cities that are all basically about equal in size. There's Saginaw, there's Bay City, and Midland. So w- that's our tri city up in this neck of the woods. And mm. Bay City has a large Polish ethnic contingent. And, right. Uh, and, and so when my son was going to school there, because we lived up there when he was in high school, um, he dated a gal who you would have swore her name was Drizwicky if you pronounce it the way it looked. But okay. It was Javitsky. <laughs> Javitsky, of course, not Drizwicky. It started with a D. <laughs> uh, come on. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah we, have a, uh, we have a terrific engineer at, uh, at Telos uh, whose name looks like it's pronounced Wisniewski. But uh, mm-hmm. he says, no, it's Wisniewski. So, okay, uh, yeah. Wow. Well, good to meet people and figure out how to spell it. And your name, your first name itself. I thought, well, maybe they're, maybe, uh, maybe Gary's parents just uh, didn't know how to spell Gary. And, uh, well, and it's really pronounced actually, Gary. There's a, there's a story behind that because of course there um, it, it, my, my mother's grandfather passed away in January, the year before I was born. And, um, I was going to get his name, and apparently, I think it was Jane Mansfield. One of the big stars married a guy that was that was British, and his name was Geary. Okay, and and there is a Geary Street in San Francisco, and matter of fact, my son lives down in the Detroit area now, and there's a park behind him that's two blocks away that's Geary Park, and it's spelled the same way. But oh. I, I feel blessed because Geary's okay. I would have gotten the first name of Claude. If I hadn't got Gary, so I'll take Gary. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll try to keep uh, pronouncing it uh, Geary. Geary. Uh, if that's the way it's supposed to be. Hey, uh, this week in Radio Tech is is coming up. We're going to get into the meat of the show. Uh, Geary and I are going to be talking about uh, how we, you know, started to learn about broadcast engineering, and then that that has some interest because there's a at least besides. Gary, there's one celebrity involved uh, in that of an engineering celebrity, and I'm I'm glad to uh, glad to be passing that along here in a few minutes. And then we're going to talk about, um, well, you know, wh- where are the next engineers coming from? Is that something to actually worry about? Will will the market, will the unseen hand of the marketplace take uh, take care of that on its own through um, high prices and uh, getting paid a lot in the future when there are very few engineers? Uh, just how how's it likely to work out? What can we do to help uh, make sure that at least there are people around to fix things when they break? Because uh, I'm not going to be around uh, doing broadcast engineering probably for more than another 15 years or so at the most. Shoot, I'll be 72 in in 15 years. So and 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 Gary, I, I would hasten to say, Gary, you're probably looking at retirement someplace in, uh, in the not too distant future at some point. Um, so. Anyway, we're going to be talking about that. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you in part by Broadcasters General Store. And they represent a lot of companies. And one of those companies, uh, one of those products that they represent is VoxPro. Let's take a listen. Yo, what's up? Live from NAB 2018. Hey, it's Caden. Uh, You need to check out Wheatstone and VoxPro 7.1. The upgrades are amazing. If you're a jock, if you're a talent, producer, whatever, a, a morning show, 
Everyone knows Vox Pro, everyone uses Vox Pro, everyone loves Vox Pro, but now the features for this year, 2018, on 7.1 are amazing. If you're using, uh, using version 4.5.6 and you go to 7, this is exactly what you're missing right here. The features are a game changer. It's gonna cut down your editing time by like 80%, depending on what you use Vox Pro for. And with uh, version 7.1, introducing unlimited practic button bars right here, hotkeys right here. I'm gonna show you coming out of a song. Bad things. It's a lot of bad things that they wish and they wish and they wish and they wish. So you're coming out of your song? Yeah. Start your next song right here. It's basically an entire production room right on Vox Pro. So it's the Vox Pro we know and love with a ton more features. And now uh, this is the ultimate game changer right here. Effect macros. So instead of hitting your effects button bar and going up here using your mouse for every effect, you do it right here with one click of the mouse and you're gonna cut down your editing time by about 80% without even touching this new sexy black controller. Check it out right here, Wheatstone Vox Pro 7.1 at NAB in Vegas 2018. And of course, uh, Vox Pro is alive and well for 2019 too. So check it out at Broadcasters General Store. Give them a call. Uh, their number is 352-622-7700. You know, I've been dialing that number, uh, gee, since I guess the early 1990s or maybe even before that, uh, working with Sam Phillips in Memphis, Tennessee, he'd always say, call them girls up there at uh, BGS and uh, get them on the horn for me. 352-622-7700 or, um, or uh, get them on the web at BGS.cc, BGS.cc, Broadcasters General Store. All right. Thanks a lot for their sponsorship and check out the Vox Pro. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack. Uh, Chris Tobin could not be with us today. And Gary Morrill is with us. And we're talking about um, the topic of teaching and learning. And, and Gary, I, I wonder if he, when we were talking about setting up the show and, and what to chat about, um, what we do, I asked you, hey, let's talk about what you're passionate about. And Gary, wh what did you tell me? Well, I tell you, I am passionate about where we're going to bring along the next uh, generation of engineers. And like I was explaining to you, the reason why that's so important to me is because I feel that I got a leg up when I was first starting. And, um, you know, I, I just want to be able to pay that forward. And when we were chatting, I, I had mentioned to you that uh, I had a buddy that was a year behind me uh, in school. So when I was in my first year of college, he was still a senior in high school when mm. we met. Uh, but his name is Steve Church, or was Steve Church. It still is his name, but he's not with us anymore, unfortunately. But um, Steve was one of my early mentors when... Uh, when I was just getting started in this project. And it, it really started when when uh, he came into the college environment where I was at Lansing Community College, and we started uh, working on projects. I mean, we built an automation system from scratch. Oh, we did a whole cool. bunch of goofy things. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> there's a story behind that. They, they wanted to close down the uh, the college radio station over, um, over the um, finals week, and they'd mm -hmm. always done that. And so we had to go dark. And so we built an automation system and really all it was was a stepper that took everything in the production studio and everything in the control room and just kind of went, at, you know, the old ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. And uh, we set that up so that we could actually broadcast, although we couldn't do live, not, nobody was in there. And it was so funny because the, um, the uh, director of student personnel services, Dean Shar was his name, who actually I was related to, he... Um, he came down the hallway because somebody told him they're on the they're on the air. They're they're in there. And he walked down there and we, we have pictures of him staring through the window. There's nobody there. But we're on the air, baby. So yeah. Oh my goodness. What what year would that have been? That would have been nineteen seventy two. Okay. okay, so a radio automation in 1972 at what what community co was that a, a college right Lancer Community College we had a okay. closed circuit station it they now have a uh, they now have an FM there uh, years after years after I left that place but during the period of time that I was there there were a whole bunch of us that worked in commercial radio. I mean, uh, and Steve was there, another buddy of mine by the name of Tim Segrist that's been worked for years in the Detroit market. Um, the, these were guys that were just passionate about radio.
And of course, we all kind of started out in programming. A lot of people don't realize that besides Steve being one heck of an engineer, he was a great talk show host. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was still doing talk shows when he was down uh, with Malwright. And a matter of fact, the whole thing with Telos wouldn't have even happened except he was fed up with the way his phone calls sounded when he did talk shows. So he built that thing for himself. That's the story I always tell people. I was just writing, uh, actually, I was making a presentation uh, over the last couple of days for new employees at Telos, you know, some onboarding, as the term is now, uh, onboarding right. for new employees, because uh, Telos has been hiring uh, several people. We got a couple of job openings right now at Telos. Um, and and uh, uh, I tell the story. Was, Steve was a talk show host, and he, he was, just like you said, fed up with the way the phone sounded. And he thought, can we do better than this? And uh, I, we've told that story before, but you know that was the time when Steve heard about this this new technology called DSP, digital signal processing. And I'm I, the story I heard was that there were a total of five of these new DSP chips in the U.S. Uh, made by Texas Instruments. And he got hold of one of them and the data sheet and the, the programming information for it. And he and uh, some professor, uh, I want to say a professor in Indianapolis, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, I think figured right. out, yeah, figured out to write some code to um, uh, to do several things, but mostly a, an adaptive um, uh, hybrid uh, for phone lines that would adapt to the changing conditions of the phone line. Yeah, and the Bell Labs guys had given up on the whole idea of ever being able to improve anything. Um, uh, I was I was in the audience when he rolled that when he rolled that product out at the NAB, and you should have just seen the mouths drop because they had a live mic and they had live speakers, and he was talking, and it was a phone call, and people could tell it, and they're talking back and forth, and there's 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 no side by. I mean, it's just it was just clean as a whistle. Everybody was just losing their minds. Right. And right. he was selling, he was selling right after that. I mean, that was, people were going, I got to have one of these. <laughs> well, you know, you invent a better mousetrap and, uh, you know, the, 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 the homeowners who don't want mice be the path to your door. And, and just yeah, so, uh, 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 we, we do have a few listeners or viewers who are not broadcast engineers. The problem with telephone, putting phone calls on the air before, uh, Steve church invented this was that any audio that you sent to the caller, so like this microphone, the disc jockey's microphone, any audio sent you sent to the caller, a pretty fair amount of that audio would come back from the phone line, but it would sound bad, and it would mix. It was it was delayed or it was phase delayed, and so you mix it with your microphone on the console, and all of a sudden the disc jockey starts to sound really bad because you're mixing this audio coming back. So that what you wanted to design was a circuit such that. Any audio you sent to the caller, you know, you, the disc jockey's microphone to the caller, none of that would come back from the caller. Only the caller's voice would come back from the caller. And that's the magic that Steve worked with digital signal processing. Right. And and I mean, it, we take it for granted today, but it was it just wasn't there. I mean, and the mm. other problem was every time you changed a phone call, the next person that came on that phone line had completely different characteristics. And so every phone call sounded different and, mm. and it was crazy. You would, they would go in and try to manually tune the bridge and stuff so that it was, so it would null everything out. And then you take mm -hmm. the next call and, and you're right back where you started. Yeah. 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 I, Hey, I, I was at a station that had, uh, uh, this was, Oh gosh, this would have been, I'm, I'm not sure what year it was. It was the late 80s. I saw this device. I don't know when the device came from, but it had a Wheatstone bridge uh, set up. Or it had some kind of a hybrid bridge in there with a light dependent resistor and a light. And it, it would hunt and try to null the phone line the best it could, but it could only do it essentially for one frequency. And Steve's invention right. nulled the phone line at multiple frequencies, which, by the way, that's that's why modern day digital phone hybrids, when you punch a line to talk to somebody, that's why they send a burst of noise to the caller like that. And they measure what comes back and, right. and whatever comes back, they try to null that out so that it's not there. And then we put the caller on, on the air. So yeah, pretty, pretty yeah. cool technology. So that was awesome thing. So, I mean, this is, this is the guy that I got to learn from. 
okay? And, I mean, he had been tearing stuff apart and putting it back together probably since about age nine. And uh, he, he, they had built a high school uh, radio station, if you will. It was a studio, and it was closed circuit, and it was right behind, uh, right behind WILS, which is where I got my first full time uh, commercial job. And so, you know, I met these guys, and and we worked on different stuff together. I mean, and and then I was on the programming side of things, and I went, in, you know, I came up to Bay City, went on the air uh, four months after I got there doing all nights i'm doing mornings and it was about four years down the road and our engineer was leaving to go back into his family's hvac business and uh i got the opportunity to shift from programming over into engineering and like i told you you know being an old farm kid i'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer but i did figure out that the salespeople drove nice cars and every time that the format changed it seemed like the programming people had to leave but the engineer got to stay and i uh-huh. I, I like to eat you know i had i like to support habits like eating and sleeping where it's warm so <laughs> that made sense to me to, you know to go into engineering and and i enjoyed it i mean and i still do i i would i wish right now gary i, I know we have a live audience listening or watching on uh, either on a, a gfq live tv or uh, okay. On Facebook, of course, we publish the show on uh, on YouTube uh, after the show is over, a day or so after, so it's there forever. But uh, uh, I would love to ask our audience a question right now: How many of you, audience engineers, knows how many of you noticed what Gary just said that stations change formats and they change on air staff, and the engineer, the engineer typically stays. Because, you know, the engineer, well, the engineer knows where all the bodies are buried, so to speak. He knows where the skeletons of the closets are. He knows where the transmitter is that oftentimes nobody else in the station even knew where it was if it wasn't co-located at the station. So, yeah. Well, and if they're changing technology, you know, it, a lot of times you're changing your technology and stuff when you're changing formats and stuff. I mean, let's face it. Uh, we did almost everything live when I first got involved in this business. And now today, you know, voice tracking is sort of the, uh, you know, the the they the the standard for an awful lot of stations if they're not running live programming well in order to put in all that technology somebody had to do it ahead of time Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. be kind of quiet about it and guess what that's the engineer you're right about being quiet about it i was asked several times to you know put this in the rack but don't let anybody see it yet yeah, we used to oh, do the same thing with audio processing, but that was for our competitors, not for. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea you know, what you're doing. <laughs> uh, you know, for for a long time, I was a contract engineer, and so I would you know go station to station, and I there was um there was a guy as long as we're telling stories here, we'll 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 get to your other ideas on 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 you know recruiting and teaching and all that. Uh, I, yeah. I, there's a, a guy that a lot of people know, an engineer named Mike Gideon. And Mike was uh, worked in the St. Louis area, worked in the Memphis area, worked in the Nashville area. And Mike had done some contract engineering. And whenever I and, and but Mike had left the area and I uh, ended up taking over engineering uh, several stations that that he had built or rebuilt. And Mike was such a great engineer that whenever something went wrong, it was never something easy. It was never because something was done poorly, you know, upon build. It was always right. the weirdest problem in the world that you would never suspect, and neither would would have Mike because this, the, it was done right. Uh, but one thing I noticed is, you know, Mike was always very particular about his processing, and he was one of the early adopters of uh, Glenn Clark's uh, Texar Audio Prism, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so Mike was so secretive that uh, not only did he he cover them up in the rack. But he also took the the faceplate where, where, that covered up the screws, you know, the the screw controls. Mm-hmm. And he took mm-hmm. the faceplate and and he scraped off the word Texar. So mm-hmm. it, nowhere on the front panel was there a clue, except I mean, you know, the LEDs were there. But if you didn't know this product and know where to go looking for it, you wouldn't know what it was, and it had no Absolutely. name on it. <laughs> <So> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I well, had one station. And- <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, we, we, uh, w- I was with Midwest Family Broadcast Group at that time as a director of engineering when Glenn brought that out. And mm. I was doing some writing for Radio World, and it was audio processing. And so when that rolled out at the show, I went over and talked to him. I said, I've got seven FMs that we need this on. He actually flew a Cessna 172 in to each of our markets and helped me set them up. So we had wow. fun with that. Wow. Yeah. So Glenn flew in to do that, huh? 
Yeah, it was it wow. was it was big fun, and and I miss him dearly. Yeah, yeah. He for those of you who don't know, Glenn did pass away in, in the last couple of weeks or so. Um, so yeah, uh, Gary, t tell me more about okay, learning by doing uh, with Steve Church, um, yep. and you worked with him uh, what in, in high school or in college only radio or what? How long did that? that well, I tell you, we we started doing stuff in in college, and of course we stayed in touch. And uh, I went to work for for Liggett Broadcast Group when he went move. He moved down to Florida. He was um, going down there to WRKT. He wanted to be an all night combo guy and do a talk show and stuff on AM. Of course, the problem was he got down there and it was a um, it, it, it was a downturn in the economy. And of course, advertising gets kind of flaky. All these guys kept dropping their overnight shows. And mm -hmm. so he kept bouncing around down there. And then he came back to Lansing and went to work for Bob Liggett with Liggett Broadcast Group that owned WFMK. He was the engineer. Bob started buying more stations and he became the director of engineering for the whole group. And that's that's oh. when I worked with him and I got into engineering because we needed somebody in Saginaw to do, you know, 100,000 watt FM. And like I yeah. told you, uh, we started doing that. We went in and modified an AEL transmitter from a 4CX1000 driver to a 5CX1500 driver, which was the world's largest heat kit project. It came in boxes <laughs> with, a, with a ream of instructions. I mean, it was ugly. Oh, but wow. that's a story for another night. Um, but then we got involved with that. And then my boss said to me, he says, uh, we're going to sell the AM station. And we're going to make it a directional. And so we have a 1,000 watt uh, daytime, 500 watt nighttime. We're going to take it to five kilowatts a day, one kilowatt night, three tower DA2. You're going to build it. And I was so green, I didn't even know I couldn't do it. So I just started connecting with the people that were, you know, that, that were available as resources to me. And... Mm -hmm asked a lot of questions and kept my mouth shut and listened a lot. And then we just started doing what they said. And lo and behold, it took about a year, but we got the thing built. Now, th this this topic of building an AM directional, on the one hand, uh, I think that that is probably one of the most complicated projects that you could possibly have. There's electronics, there's physics, there's geography involved, there's uh, legal paperwork. There's a lot, uh, so much involved, uh, including probably hiring a, 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 a surveyor to come out at night and, as they say, shoot Polaris, you know, to find out exactly where the North Star is, because uh, exactly. these are based on 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 the not magnetic north, which moves around, but on the geographic north. Um, uh, and so th I think this is one of the most complicated things that can be done. Now, in as we move forward with broadcasting, I figure there's probably less and less AM directional work to be done. I don't know where that's headed, but it doesn't seem like it's headed in the direction of uh, flourishing business. But talk to me for just a minute before we go to break here. Talk to me for a minute or two about, about why building an AM directional is a fantastic way to learn about a broadcast electronics. Uh, well, f for me, it was, you know, I was just immersed in it because when we, when we first got down to the site, uh, there was pickles growing in the field and, you know, I could relate to that having grown up on a farm, but, but, you know, we're going to build this whole thing. And so I'm, I'm dealing with vendors. I'm dealing with a consultant engineer, uh, Lonis and Culver was our consultants and, um, and, and so, you know, we're in this whole process and, and while I was not you know, I, I'm the guy that's doing the work. I'm not doing the design. The design was mm -hmm. done by a guy by the name of, of of Vern Post, and Vern had built stuff back in the in the 40s, right after the right after the war, and I think he came out of Ohio State and and got his EE there, and so I mean he'd been building them for 30 years before I ever saw what a directional was, mm -hmm. and so. I'm 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 at his elbow and we're building it, you know, piece by piece by piece by piece by piece. And uh the um the the entire um the entire phaser and the ATUs was built by a company by at that time was known as CSP, that was Dave Gorman, and mm -hmm. it's phase tech mm -hmm. these days. And so I made acquaintance with those guys at that point in time. And and quite frankly, that relationship has continued through this day. But it was it was just 
there were so many things involved with this, and people don't realize that when you're dealing with an FM, uh, everything is up the tower, and that's the antenna. In an AM, the, the tower, the ground system, everything else, it's all out there, and it's spread out, and the frequency, you know, the wavelength is so much longer that uh, yeah, it's pretty complicated. You know, I try to explain to people that in FM, the tower just holds the antenna up. In AM, the tower is the antenna. Yeah, and, exactly. and it's just a whole yeah. different ball game. Yeah. And, and with AM, it seems like you have a, you have a lot more physical things to deal with. Uh, like where, where do you place the, the coax underground if you're using coax or, you know, the open yep. wire line, if it's above ground and then you have sample lines to deal with too, right? Oh, maybe. And, and the sample lines here, when, when this place that I'm at in Saginaw was put in, somebody decided that they were going to save a few bucks because they also owned a, a cable TV company down in Metro. And so no. they actually, they actually buried, it was phase stabilized cable, but it was copper jacket, or I mean, it was aluminum jacketed. And apparently mm. they nicked the jacket multiple times when they were putting it in and they just <sighs> taped it up. Oh, well, ticking time bomb. Because you know what yeah. happens when moisture hits aluminum. Yeah. Yeah, that was oh. fun. We just rebuilt the whole thing about three years ago. So it's uh, it's now the way it should have been way back when. But uh, that was not inexpensive at all. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. So uh, when, when we come back, uh, Gary, I want to continue to talk about, about your learning process. It sounds, you know, a, a lot like mine, but maybe, you know, 10 years, 15 years different in time. Um, uh, but a lot of the same things, you, you know, you run across things and you just dive into them and learn about them. And also want you to talk to us a little bit about how you figure out what it is you don't know. Uh, so that you can find that thing out. So I, I like to understand a bit about the learning process, and we'll talk about uh, mentoring and recruiting as well, and and maybe how we can uh, how we can do more of that, uh, and f you know find find young people who uh, have an aptitude for for broadcast engineering and and, and want to find out about how to do it and, and help them get uh, in, in a career for it. Hey, you're watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech. It's our 443rd episode. I'm Kirk Harnack. Uh, Chris Tobin is away this week. Be back next week. And we're talking to Gary Morrill uh, about uh, learning, education, and uh, some fun times in, in, uh, you know, in engineering for radio stations back in the day and moving up, up to today. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at CalREC Audio. We'll be right back. CalREX Type R is a modular, expandable IP based radio system featuring three slimline panels, a fader panel, a large soft panel, and a small soft panel easily configured to give the operator full control. Layouts are saved and recalled quickly between shows. A single 2RU core with integrated I.O. gets customers up and running fast, and that single core can power up to three independent mixing environments with no sharing of DSP resources. Available in four DSP packs, and as your station grows, larger packs can be added, enabling it to grow with you. Power to the surface is supplied via standard PoE switches, keeping cabling to a minimum. Type R is fully AES67 compatible, as defined by SMPTE 2110, which means that it is also compliant with NMOS discovery and connection management specs. All these features combined make Type R the most flexible radio console you can buy. Find out more at calrec.com slash twerk. Do check that out, calrec.com slash twerk to find out more about Calrec Type R for radio. A hey, studio guest, you know, are only human, and humans, well, we cough and we sniff and we clear our throats, <clears throat> even on the air. You can cure this, though, with the Angry Audio Guest Gizmo. You press the cough button, and that mutes the mic. Every guest needs one of these. You know what else they need? Headphones. Which is why each Guest Gizmo has a studio-quality headphone amp with individual volume control right there. Anything else? We've seen those mic arms that have the built-in LED tallies. They are beautiful. But how do you light them up conveniently? The Guest Gizmo does that too, illuminating the red light whenever the mic is hot. And installing the Guest Gizmo in your studio furniture could not be easier. All you need is that, a two and three quarter inch hole saw and a steady hand. You don't need a router. Your studio gets a clean custom appearance and you get all the credit. Check out the Guest Gizmo and all the other cool gadgets at angryaudio.com. I promise you, you need to go there. Angryaudio.com. And you will be the cool kid engineer at your radio station. I mean, Gary, I, I don't know if you've had if you had a chance to check out the stuff at, at Angry Audio, but I, I can highly recommend it. Absolutely highly recommend it. Absolutely.
Um, so, uh, after your experience with, uh, with Steve and your building of a directional, surely you, uh, you got a little more help from other people, whether you were under their tutelage or just people you could call up. I got a lot of my education on the phone with, uh, manufacturer support departments. And I figured out the key, at least for me to not feel guilty about calling and just asking for a free education. Um, I had enough of the stuff figured out, but occasionally there's a piece of the puzzle that didn't fit. And so I would, yeah, you know, I never call a manufacturer and say, Hey, uh, my cart machine's not working. What do I do? No, no, no. <laughs> you got to troubleshoot it at least to the point where you can't go any, any further at all and call up and say, Hey, I've got voltage here. I got voltage here. I push the button and the solenoid doesn't come up or I'm not hearing the right channel of audio, but I, I'm, you know, what th that was my key. What was it for you in learning? It, it really was the same type of thing. You know, you, you would go through and, and obviously you'd be looking at stuff and, and you'd follow your basic procedures. I mean, you know, I got some training. Uh, I went to night Throwing school for, the for two years. Of course, the problem was he got down there. And Sorry. It was a. Um, it's okay. Um, so, so I got. Um, I'm, I just lost my train of thought there for a moment. I, you know. I got training because I was going to night school for about two years. So I had basic electronics down, but you're working on a piece of equipment that's pretty complicated and you would run into something that just didn't make any sense. And so like the same thing, I would call the manufacturer and say, uh, I'm running into something very curious and, and I'm just hoping that perhaps it's something you've seen before that you might be able to enlighten me on. And we'd talk about it and we'd get mm -hmm. talking. And, and if you, if it's not a confrontational situation, if you're not screaming at people and stuff, they're more than happy to help you. I mean, every, every uh, legitimate manufacturer out there actually enjoys talking to the end users because they get feedback from it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you can solve a problem with them, chances are good. Somebody else not too far down the road is going to have an issue similar and they'll go, aha. I remember this. And so you're actually providing them some some feedback, too, because not everything that's going to happen with a piece of equipment is going to happen when it's on the factory floor. It's going to happen out the field. And and so, uh, you know, I mean, I, I worked with 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 so many people and a lot of them aren't with us anymore. But, um, you know, I had, a, I had a chap by the name of Howard Debedock that that had been a director of engineering for a group. And then he also had a company that, that actually built towers. And uh, it was kind of enlightening at Midwest area structures. These guys could go up and you'd be working with them on a facility. And not only did you have a capable tower crew, but you had a guy that actually knew what was going on. Mm. And, uh, you know, I mean, he designed them and built them and stuff. And, and he and I did a project in Lansing together when I was at Whittle there, where we built a 680-foot uh, uh, FM tower right in the middle of a three-tower array. I just couldn't get away from AM directionals, I guess. So uh, <laughs> you know, that was a situation where we made that thing invisible. And it took three levels of skirting to make it happen. But uh, it worked. Gary, I was just thinking about the companies that that actually gave me an education by me yeah. being polite and somewhat knowledgeable on the phone, but not having all the answers, not knowing exactly what to do next. And see, see if if uh, if my checklist is anywhere near yours. Uh, I got good education years ago. Now, I don't I don't know how they are now, but I got good education years ago from Harris. Yep. Uh, uh, also, I got good education from Continental on their transmitters. Absolutely. You, you know who was terrific was ITC or ITC 3M. Yep. The, uh, yeah, they they taught me about like NPN and PNP transistors, basically. You know, it, it that was in a, in a not – things change. Um, uh -huh. It got interesting when 3M bought them. But when it was just ITC, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Solid. So yeah, and, and, I, I still had yeah, I still had good luck when when they were also 3M at least at least for a time. But yeah, go ahead. Okay, no, I mean, and, and like I said, I got no, I got nothing ill to say because everybody deals with things and and uh, you know places change hands, and sometimes that makes a difference in a better way, and sometimes it makes it in a not so better way. But you know, it, everybody wants to help you. This this whole industry is that way. It's a small tight group of individuals. And as long as you are civil with folks, they're more than happy to help you. 
because they want you to be successful. I mean, people don't seem to understand that outside of our broadcasting uh, community, you know, with engineering. But uh, guys don't fight like like programming departments did when we were all separate radio stations. You'd have a fight in the market, but the engineers would help each other. I mean, if you're off the air and and I'm I'm free, hey, I'm coming over to help you, brother. Yeah, and, and I yeah. might even bring a part that you don't have and help you get back on the air. Seems like that I also got uh, also got good help from Orban. Uh, I, I didn't have to call them very often, but uh, their manuals were so helpful, especially the appendix at at the end. Remember that thing that uh, that that Bob Orban wrote about, you know, uh, maintaining audio quality in the broadcast studio. Yes, yes, yeah, and 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 a sharp guy, and uh, you know, did a lot of stuff with him. I mean, uh, we used we used an awful lot of Orban stuff up until up until the point that uh, this uh, Frank Foti chap came along and we kind of <laughs> changed our allegiances there. But that's just another story for another time as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was the same same way exactly. Used to own a lot of Orban gear until Foti came along. Hey, uh, so let <laughs> um, any other uh, yeah continuing uh, knowledge and education. I see you've got a broadcast. Uh, uh, engineering a handbook there on your shelf behind you it looks like an like an old one um oh yeah uh what uh, you know th that can be some pretty dry reading although if you need to go look something up uh, a great place to start great place to get a backgrounder on the topic that you're looking up what have been a couple other resources for you uh, in your career the the biggest resource that i can tell you about since the 80s has been being involved with the society of broadcast engineers and, mm. and i'll just be real blunt about that um i was uh i was in lansing and was one of the charter members of chapter 91 when we put it together and was in the uh leadership for that for that organization for a number of years and you know, the seminars and stuff that we've been able to get our hands on and some of the distance learning that we have available to us today is amazing. And I think a lot of people don't realize that simply because maybe they're not into distance learning. Um, but we have, a, we have a, a young chap that we just hired here because uh, taking over the regional thing a couple of years ago, uh, we needed to get somebody in here as a market engineer. And like I told you, it's important for me to pay it forward. So I decided that w let's see if we can't uh, find somebody with some technical aptitude and bring them along that wants to be a broadcast engineer. And, and uh, we're in the process of doing that right now. He's completed his first month here. And now, I'm not saying he's a greenhorn because he was involved with the cable uh, industry for a number of years. And so he's used to working in the field. He's used to working on equipment and stuff. But RF was a little bit different for him, at least at the levels that we deal with it. And I, you know, I engaged with him and got him involved with the SBE and uh, talked to the ownership here and got him uh, to get a member plus uh, membership. And he just came to me the other day and he says, this is awesome. All this information that we've got here, I'm getting up to speed on this stuff. And uh, I mean, this is great. I wish everybody did this kind of stuff in other industries. And But you see, he wanted to learn. And, mm -hmm. and, and one of the challenges that we run into is, you know, I'm not a spring chicken in this industry. Uh, you know, I'm, we'll be celebrating 48 years. And so, uh, there comes a time, it seems like, with a lot of with a lot of my contemporaries, where some of them just get tired of learning, and, and and they say, you know, they start counting other time to retirement, and so they don't want to bother with new technology. The problem with that is, things are changing faster now than they ever have in our industry, and you know, if you're going to be competitive with with your, you know, if you're going to keep your employers competitive, you need to stay up on this stuff. And a lot of times it's evaluating it and deciding if it's something that you can apply. And other times it's something that you're going to apply. Now you need to learn how to maintain it and you need to learn how it operates because a lot of times the engineer is the guy that's got to show everybody else how it works. So mm -hmm. if you don't like doing that, if you don't like teaching, it becomes kind of hard. And if you yourself don't like to learn, whew, I, I I feel for you because it's not stagnant. You're either going to fall behind or you're going to keep moving ahead with the industry. There really isn't there really isn't a place to just sit. 
It, yeah. it just doesn't work. And, 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 uh, you know, it's not a lot of people that find themselves in that mode, but it's enough to where I've seen it more than once or twice. Wow. I, that, there are some profound words that you, you said there. Um, and, and, uh, unfortunately I, you know, I used to read radio world cover to cover and to feel like I was really up on every, everybody's thoughts on, on new technology or old techniques or tried and true techniques. And I've got a stack of radio worlds back here and I, I love reading them. It's, it seems like I don't set aside enough time to read more than a, than a few headlines. Um, but I, I, that, that's a way that I really learned as, as well as, you know, talking to support departments is I would, I, I'd be on the road as a contract engineer. I'd stop at Wendy's to have lunch and I'd read radio world cover to cover while I was eating my, my big, Mac, uh, my big Mac, my uh, Wendy's single. Right. Um, Absolutely. and then of course I interacting with other engineers was helpful too. I was fortunate in that, uh, uh, I, as a contract engineer, I got to where I could hire a couple of engineers to work with me and a couple of them were really good. I mean, they were, they, yeah. they were sharp, sharp guys. And so I would, I'd learn from them. They were worth every penny I paid them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and I brought a guy in, uh, when I was in Lansing, uh, we needed somebody because once again, I was moving into a regional, well, I was actually the whole group's director of engineering and it was a much smaller group in those days. You had one, yeah. seven markets that you could, that you were going to deal with. And so I went to a, one of the, one of the local schools, uh, career development program and, uh, they had a career center. And I went to their electronics program, which is kind of hard to find these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I said, hey, you know, introduce me to some of the students. Who do, who do you have here that's sharp? Found a young man that, that had an aptitude that was interested in what we were dealing with. And like I said, he was in high school. He wasn't a college student. He wasn't a college graduate. And so it was young enough in the time where... I, hey, this is something we could do, and you know, I could uh, bring you along, and I'd like to show you what we're doing. And if it's of interest to you, I I have a job that you might be interested in. So he came in, and uh, he interned with us for a couple weeks. He says, "This is really awesome," because usually, a lot of times, when you get to see the magic of the end of the business, it mm -hmm. is kind of awesome. Okay, and you get the bug. <laughs> so, so, and 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 that young man was with me for a decade and a half. He was he was with me down there when I was in Lansing. Uh, I became a station owner with with the same group, uh, and we put a eighty ninety on up here back in this market. And he came up and worked with me uh, on that staff. So, but you gotta you gotta reach out and find people, you know. I keep talking about what we what we're dealing with right now, and and I don't think people realize this, but all of all of the guys that are working in IT are actually out and recruiting pretty heavily, and mm -hmm. and they're going to recruit the living daylights out of the guys at the college level and stuff, and and they're going to show them some pretty awesome stuff, and they're also going to show them something that that has basically a nine to five job, and you don't carry a you don't. Well, I'm going to show my age. You don't have to carry a pager, right? Well, no. Right. Uh, you don't have to be on call. Let's just put it that way. That is today's version. But, but you know, and then we're talking about what we're talking about. Yeah, we're going to have to make some adjustments in, in what we're paying people, which would be a good thing to do, I think, for a lot of people. But um, but we also need to get out and, and recruit people when they're still in the process of deciding what they're going to do with their life and expose them to what we're doing. And, and and maybe take some hands-on mentoring and stuff. You know, uh, there are schools around that are still doing tech programs, okay? Um, Lawrence Tech is one here that's in Michigan. And, and the SBE does have a program where if you have a technical program at a school, they will go in and certify that program and, and look, at, look at their curriculum. And if it teaches what they feel they need to have taught, uh, you can qualify for the first level of SBE certification just by completing that program. Mm, and, and that's okay. a pretty that's a pretty impressive thing. OK, um, I actually helped set up a couple different school programs and introduced them to SBE and got them engaged in that way. Uh, it's been a few years, but there was one over on the west side of the state that we did. And, uh, you know, it, it's something that we need to do. Another magic uh, that a lot of people don't seem to realize uh, Cleveland is Cleveland Institute of Electronics is still around. And oh, mm -hmm. They still, they have some awesome programs, which are certified by the SPE because they teach RF engineering. Okay. 
Oh. And, and if you know the history of, of, of Cleveland Institute of Electronics, you know that there's some pretty strong horsepower to help put that together. But they're still there. And, and it's a distance learning program. But mm -hmm. uh, if somebody's really, you know, if somebody's real green, that might be a good place for them to start and be involved with. And it's cost effective. I think it's like fifteen hundred dollars for their for their um, RF engineering program, you know, broadcast engineering. I, that's a bargain in today's educational world. I've got um, two two quick things I, I want to ask you before we go, go to break. And one is you mentioned earlier about uh, uh, SBE and, and some of the things that it offers. And, you know, the SBE for the last uh, little over a year has been promoting this idea of SBE member plus, where if you pay more uh, for your membership uh, on an annual right. basis, you get access uh, without having to pay anything extra to all of the webinars and the library of all the past webinars. Uh, yep. what has, what's been your reaction to Member Plus? Oh, it's been awesome. I mean, I think I was one of the first people to sign up for it. And of course, the young chap that's here is signed up for it. That's how he's learning. I mean, mm. because and, and 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 I'm kind of curating it for him. I said, let's go, let's go check this out, then let's move to this, then let's move to this, and and as we talk about what he understands and what he doesn't understand, I can help guide him in areas to get that information so that he'll understand what it is he's looking for. But once again, the key to that is somebody that wants to learn. OK, I mean, I heard a stat here a while back that scared the living daylights out of me. And, and it, it was this, that 37 percent of people that graduate from high school never read another book. I didn't mm -hmm. say they didn't read a magazine, but they don't read another mm -hmm. book. And I'm going, oh, my God, how, how do you function? Because, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm going off a little bit there, but <laughs> but. That's, you know, that it, it's important to be able to get that information. And, and, and the member plus, I think, I think a seminar with SBE, I think the, the standard price for that was somewhere is around 69 bucks. Okay. Yeah. For mm -hmm. a seminar. So if you do two seminars, you got like 130 bucks, 140 bucks tied up there. Well, uh, what is it? 175 for the membership? Plus. I think so about that. Member yeah. Plus? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you, if you take in two seminars, now you're, you're in, you're in high cotton, you're in free money now. Keep going brother. Cause, yeah. cause the rest yeah. of it's all free. It's gratis. Yep. Exactly. And, and, and they wonder if they did that so that engineers wouldn't have to go back to the well, so to speak, uh, to their manager and say, can I have 70 bucks? I need to watch this webinar about this technology that we're putting in place. No, it was just, it was paid for, uh, for, yeah. you know, for, for the whole year. Yeah. So here, well, here's my, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please, please, say, please the finish your thought about that. The other challenge is it's, it's not only time, or I mean, it's not only money, but it's also time. I mean, it, it, when I first started working in our industry, I was, uh, it was during that period of time when you still had to have a, a full-time first on duty with a directional station. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think at WILS, I think they had a staff of like eight engineers. Well, in today's world, it might be more likely that one engineer is handling eight stations. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so um, you not only have a challenge going to your boss for the money, but sometimes it's, hey, I'd like to take two days to go to this seminar. Oh, boy. They have as much trouble with the time as they do with the money. And so if you can do distance learning and pick up stuff, uh, you know, providing that you've got the basics down, you you can pick this stuff up pretty quick and you can stay up on things. So uh, let's uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, but let, let me hear your thoughts on um, uh, how these different disciplines of audio, RF and IT can be either mix or match. Should and should uh, an, an audio RF engineer really try to learn IT, or uh, in many cases, is is that person better off getting an IT person and teaching that person enough about the radio business that the IT specialized IT really matters to them at, at that point? And what what are your thoughts about those relationships and disciplines? Well, I'll tell you, I I look at I look at the situation that we've got with Alpha, and you got to remember that that there's there's actually two parts in the IT world because. Uh, 
when we first started moving in that direction, it was all in the back office area. It was all of the, you know, the traffic system came first and, and, and then, uh, you know, word processors and everything else. So the salespeople started putting proposals together and stuff. So they didn't have to go down to the print shop and do all these things. And, um, uh, and all those people still need to be supported. So in a, in a company, the size of alpha, we have an it department, but, we also have uh, uh, all of our staff engineers that are at the various locations are reasonably skilled in, in, in IT disciplines, some more than others. But we kind of draw the line where the, uh, where the playout systems come. OK, mm. we don't turn the guys loose uh, from the corporate IT department supporting all of the interconnectivity and going out to the web. We actually isolate our our uh, our playout systems from from the big, you know, interwebs. And so the guys that are working with us need to have some kind of a skill set there, at least from a rudimentary standpoint. And then, of course, once again, uh, I don't know of an automation system that's out there that doesn't have a support department that you can get a hold of and sort something out if you're having a challenge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with wide orbit and, uh, and they're available to us anytime because, you know, we pay a service contract, but it only makes sense because that's, that's your money funnel. If that thing shuts down, you have a bad day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. And how, and how different broadcasters handle, uh, the relationship of, of uh, studios and IT or RF and IT in, in lots of different ways. So there may not be a right way or a wrong, the wrong way is for those people to fight. That's the wrong way. That's you right. know, they have, when they have That's different right. goals, Absolutely. everybody's goal should be, you know, great audio, great coverage on the air all the time. That's, that well, it, take, it takes all the pieces. It takes all the pieces to the puzzle to be successful in this business. If yeah. everybody's at each other's ne I mean, it, no, no. Is any one more important than the other? No. I mean, quite frankly, I think sales is perfectly important, but then I like to be, you know, I like my check to cash. So <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. I, I want that to happen. Okay. Uh, um, hey, we're going to uh, come back in a minute with a tip of the week. I've got one that something that just happened to me today, and it is apl applicable to, to broadcasting and it's applicable to uh, station management and ownership as well. As, as well as everyday life. And I'm um, hoping that Geary will have uh, a tip of the week that we can walk away with and put to use as well. This week in Radio Tech, episode 443, I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at, but... Have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features the jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments. Dual mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on air and production modes, and enough DSP and IO options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. And if you go to that website, please add the slash twert. Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash twert. It'll take you right 
to the radio resources at Lavo, and it'll let them know that we sent you there, and we appreciate that very much. Appreciate Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Great sponsor. Hey, uh, it's Kirk Harnack, episode 443, and I'm here with Gary Morrill, and we've got a uh, tip of the week for you. And uh, I'm, uh, well, <laughs> we'll let we'll let Gary go first. Gary, uh, do you have a tip of the week for us, please? I do. And and this is something that we didn't talk about, but we should have. And that is the fact that if you are trying to learn about this industry, let's say that you don't know everything that you want to know, you're relatively new to the industry, or if you're somebody that, that feels like I do, that you'd like to be able to pay it forward, um, I'd like you to go touch base with the Society of Broadcast Engineers and find out about their mentorship program. It's actually a, 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 a formal program that's in place that, that takes the place of what we used to have when we had uh, engineering staffs of several people and you could bring along junior people. If you're in a situation where you're by yourself and you're trying to learn and, and you're trying to get a grasp on this or you'd like to explore the industry and, and maybe see if you can find a career in, in the technical side of our industry, check out the mentorship program. I'm involved with it as a mentor. Uh, the young chap that's here is a mentee, and I have a couple other folks that I'm mentoring. It's a great program. Check it out. And I will put a link to that page. You can find that. You go to sbe.org, and under uh, education, I think, uh, just go look look for uh, mentoring or mentorship. But I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And uh, I have not gotten to participate in that yet, and I would love to. i, I got to figure out what else to to uh, to cut out in, in my daily activities, or at least um, my responsibilities. I'm on several committees at SBE, and and uh, I but I would love to do mentoring. I mean, people like Chris Tarr are doing it. You're doing it. Uh, some of the great engineers across our country are, are mentoring uh, other people. So that's that is awesome. Um, Absolutely. So um, my my tip uh, is really something that happened to me today. Um, just today. Uh, look, I, I I know something about cars mechanical stuff, but not enough to really want to get in and do any more than change a spark plug uh, or you know fix a wiring harness or or something like that. I've I've, I've done brakes, sure. Uh, I've never done an engine overhaul. I, I don't want to get that deep into it. Hey, I, I refill the air conditioner with Freon, you know, when it needs it every year or two, right? Uh, I can do that kind of thing. But um, uh, if there's something that you got to outsource, like maybe your car's having engine trouble, Maybe at your transmitter site, your uh, your generator's not starting up right away or won't start at all. My my point here is that get a second opinion. Get a second opinion. Uh, sure, you might have somebody that, who you trust, and that's great. But you get a second opinion to find to figure out who to trust, and of course, maybe get a different diagnosis. So uh, my wife and I uh, actually, my, my, my wife drives it. Uh, she has a a, a Jeep Commander. And it was having a little bit of um, of problems, uh, and I won't go into all the details. But we got the first opinion from a place that was five star rated, um, gave us an opinion, and the opinion was, "Your engine is shot. You need a new one." Not sure if it's worth it to spend the money or not, because you're going to spend as much on on the engine as the car is worth. And uh oh, you're going to need a new transfer case for the four wheel drive as well. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't sitting real well, real well with us. My wife loves the car. So we were trying to figure out how are we going to come up with literally about $11,000, which is what they wanted, which seemed a little outlandish to me. But this was a highly rated place, okay? And I'm sure they do good work. Uh, it's just that the work they wanted to do was everything, right? So we took it to another place, uh, recommended by a relative. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in a part of town where, let's just say, people don't have as much money to put into fixing their cars. and the tax title license, the fix out the door, 480 bucks because the problem was not the engine. <laughs> the problem was one of the long heater hoses to the third row of seats in the back was leaking. And the other problem, eh, it may be a problem someday, but he reset the computer and told the car that, hey, the transfer case is really OK. Let's let's go and see how it lasts. It may last two months. It may last two years. It may last 10 years. So anyway, get a second opinion, especially on things that you're going to outsource. Maybe it's tower work, right? Uh, maybe it's uh, doing something like uh, you're building an FM directional, and maybe you ought to check with a couple different professional engineers who are going to or who are going to cite it in uh, as far as the direction. Maybe you're going to uh, maybe your generator, as mentioned earlier, needs some service, or you just want to get a quote on getting the gen generator put in or refurbished or whatever. 
get a couple of of opinions on that. Gary, what what's your thought on second opinion? Actually, it's Music. actually oh, critical. No, there we yeah. go. It's actually very critical because because you don't know what you don't know, and yeah. and and well. Just take it, take it with car insurance. I mean, whichever company you work with, usually every year it goes up. You ever notice that every other car insurance company always wants to save you about five hundred dollars? How the heck do they do that? Well, it's yeah. because you we're we're humans and we tend to develop habits that we want to run with. Okay, because it's simple for us. Nobody wants to be dealing with options on everything all the time. But mm. darn it, if it's a if it's a chunk of change, you better have a second opinion because you might learn something that you didn't realize. And that's not to say the other people are dishonest, but sometimes people don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good, good point. And hey, you get other opinions and you might find out there's a, a, a better, faster, cheaper way to do something than you were doing before. Uh, and that, Gary, that goes back to engineers not wanting to learn new tricks. These days, yeah. Gary, I, I would I would put my I would put my heels in the ground and say no to wiring a conventional analog or even AES studio. I'm going AOIP no matter what. I'm just not touching the, yeah. the old stuff. Well, we've we've got it. We've got a build that we're going to be doing over in the Chicagoland area yet this year. We're consolidating a couple of our of our uh, markets that are around uh, a hub around Chicago, and uh, we were talking about it and talking with some of the senior management, and they said, "Well, can't we use a lot of this equipment?" And I'm going, "Oh man, by the time we get done doing the audio trunking, the labor." and the cable and stuff, uh, we're going to save you money by going in and doing AOIP. And we're going to mm. save you time because we have to build it. Once they give us the go, we've got five months to get it done. It's going into a mall. And mm. that's a whole other story for another day. But, man, I mean, it, what we can build today in a period of time compared to what we used to do, I mean, yeah, if you like to crimp connectors and stuff, yeah, I, I, I feel for you, brother. But, but. Let's do that. Let's do it quick. You can do a whole studio in a day these days. You yes, and 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 everything everything tied down in, in a day. And then if you got to make a few changes, guess what? Get on your computer keyboard and make. Oh, you want your mic processing a little more bass? No problem. You know, I'm I'm a seven hour drive away. Sure, a little more bass. There you go. Tell me how you like it. Yeah. While you're I hear talking, you. how's it sound now? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Gary, I, I'd love to have you back on the show, especially after you, uh, during or after you do a project and tell us uh, about the process and, and how it went. Would you do that for us? Yeah, we can do that. Happy to All do right. it. All right. Love, love to hear it. Hey, uh, Gary Morrill, uh, you are the regional director of engineering over at Alpha Media in the, in Michigan, right? Saginaw. That's right. All yeah, right. of course, I have about eight states that I help, but uh, Michigan's one of them. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, wanna, I want to. I I can't reveal anything just yet. I'm 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 on a certain committee, uh, but uh, look for Gary Morrill's name to show up again in your life, um, and uh, you may want to you may want to give him some, some consideration when you do. That's all I can say. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. I appreciate you being with us so much. Thank you. Hey, it's a, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. All right. And it's been my pleasure, too. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, episode 443, um, uh, has been brought to you by our usual cadre of wonderful sponsors, the folks at Vox Pro, CalRec, Angry Audio, and Lavo. And I've been doing the show this week, as I do most weeks, from the Telos Alliance Studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, thanks. Big thanks to our producer, who is Suncast. And he is running the controls. And also thanks to uh, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. Uh, hey, next week, we should be at a transmitter site somewhere in Mississippi. We may be surrounded by water, flood water. I just saw a picture of the transmitter site I want to do the show from uh, today. And yeah, it's in the middle of a big old pond called a field that's flooded. So we'll see if we can get in there or not. Uh, we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.